Discovery, did you call? Yes, Kurt. Uh, sorry to wake you up. Uh, we, uh, we have a bit of a, a payload problem at this point. The orbiter's in fine shape. Um, the problem, basically, is that we've lost our command capability to the uh, payloads on the TAS hitchhiker, and uh, we're losing quite a bit of science uh, on the TAS and the IEH uh, hitchhikers, and as well, uh, the SLA, uh, the laser that's on the uh, TAS is on at this point, and we have no way of turning it off, and so we had some uh, steps for you to perform. Uh, we'd like to, uh, to try those out, and, uh, and they'll only take a, a couple of minutes. Uh, we think maybe there's a possibility that on the TAS payload, the master control unit has uh, locked up, so we'd like to reset it, and we have some switch throws and checks for you on the SSP, the TAS portion of the SSP on L12 when you're ready. Hey, Mark, we have a Barbara Paul call back. Copy, Kurt. Now the ground is going to quickly look to make sure that everything is powered off, and we're going to call you back in a second. Stand by to power it back on. Discovery Houston for Kurt. We're ready to power back up. The first switch that we would like you, the first and only switch, is we'd like you to take the TAS avionics power switch back to on. Hold it for about three seconds until you get the talk back up indication. Okay, Mark, here it comes. Discovery Houston, uh, it looks like that worked, uh, Kurt. We uh, really appreciate your uh, getting up uh, to help us with that, and there's no further action at this time, and we'll see you at wake up. Okay, Mark, uh, does that mean that uh, looks like y'all have commanding back? We have uh, only checked the telemetry side, uh, and uh, we'll uh, have to check the command side. It'll take a little bit of time. And uh, if we're not successful, we'll have no further actions either way until tomorrow. Okay, Mark, no problem. We, uh, we, uh, we're up here to, to help out, so uh, no problem at all. Good morning, Discovery. Uh, chances are Beamer knows where we got that song from. Hey, good morning, Houston. Thanks for the music.
and uh, we're getting you loud and clear. I assume at this point we're talking to Mission Specialist uh, Bob Kerbeam. Yes, I'm speaking to you from the mid-deck of the Space Shuttle Discovery. We just passed over Sri Lanka and going towards the western coast of Australia. Lieutenant Commander Bob Kirby, we welcome you to KMOX this morning. Uh, you are how far into the mission so far on board Discovery? We're approximately five days into uh, an 11-day mission. Bob, how are the other experiments going? You're, you're working with, with the space arm, with the robotic arm on board the shuttle. How are those experiments going? Most of the experiments are going quite well, actually, Steve. Uh, we have, um, like you said, quite a few experiments. The robotic arm, we did some work on that this morning. Steve and Jan were quite pleased with how that went. And we also have a, a bunch of other experiments looking at hale bopp the comet, and uh, various solar system, you know, uh, celestial objects that are in the solar system, and all those are going well as well. Bob, this, is, this mission, the 11-day mission of the Discovery, has international significance from the standpoint of some of the things you're doing. Let's talk about the role other countries are playing in what you're doing in space right now. Actually, you're right. This is a, a fairly international mission. We have um, experiments from all over the world. We have an experiment from the University of Trieste in Italy. We have um, Solcon from the University of Belgium. We have uh, very, various universities in the United States contributing uh, their experiments here as well, University of Southern California, University of Colorado, and several of the uh, NASA centers like Ames and um, also Goddard and, of course, Johnson and Kennedy participating. So this is uh, a worldwide event, and we're just happy to be a part of it. And the satellite that is gathering the ozone data is built in Germany. Tell me about your hopes, you and your fellow astronauts, for what you are going to learn on this mission about the ozone layer and what we might be able to do to protect it here on Earth. Well, Crystal Spot is uh, relatively unique in that not only can it uh, look at the ozone layer and look at where we're depleting it and where we're not and where it seems to be holding up, but it can look at all the constituents of the middle atmosphere, all the significant ones. And by doing that and tracking where we see the different constituents, we can tell more about the upper wind patterns, the um, weather, and uh, just basically we can hopefully predict how that upper atmosphere will change and how long um, the ozone will hold out in different areas. And hopefully it will hold out for a very long time. Bob, you bear the title of mission specialist. With that title, what is your role? What are you responsible for? Actually, I'm mission specialist, too. I'm a flight engineer, so I, fly, I do both ascent and entry up on a flight deck. So it involves a lot of uh, helping the commander and the pilot power the shuttle and making sure um, those uh, phases of flight go well. But also I do a lot of the, the um, um, environmental jobs around the shuttle, uh, making sure the air scrubbers work fine to take out the carbon dioxide. I also do, um, I'm in charge of several of the experiments that are going on, like um, the bioreactor experiment where I'm growing uh, colon cancer cells to learn more about how they grow and hopefully how to stop them from growing. And um, a lot of the experiments in the payload bay that are looking at Jupiter, the sun, uh, the Earth's atmosphere, and also doing some laser mapping of the Earth. Bob, you mentioned a little bit ago about an experiment to observe the hale bopp comet that so many of us saw from afar when it passed by the Earth a couple of months ago. What are you hoping to see and to learn about hale bopp Well, the big advantage of being up here in space is that you don't have the atmosphere attenuating a lot of the uh, light that hale bopp is giving off, so it's a little bit clearer in different frequencies as far as, uh, especially frequencies that we can't see with the naked eye. So by being up here, we can look at the different, uh, what we call spectral lines of, that the comet is giving off and tell more about what it consists of, what kind of trace elements are in it, and hopefully learn more about uh, the formation of our own solar system because uh, comets are considered uh, some um, of the remnants of the original formation of the solar system. Bob, you have, uh, you're married, you have a couple of children. Since this is your first mission, how do you prepare them for 11 days away in space on board the Discovery? Well, um, being in the Navy, my wife, I think, is, uh, because I am in the Navy, my wife understands that uh, at certain times I have to be separated from my family. But, it's, of course, it's a little more difficult for our kids, especially since tomorrow is my daughter's birthday. And I won't be able to say happy birthday to her tomorrow, so I'll say it now, happy birthday, Eva. And uh, 
so it's a little more difficult for them, and they don't understand why Dad has to leave for two weeks all the time. But um, I think that by uh, preparing them for it, talking to them a lot beforehand, and explaining to them just how important the missions that we go on are, um, they're much more accepting of it, and they know that uh, we'll have fun before the mission. They, I think they enjoyed the launch, and we'll have a whole lot of fun after it, too. My name is Amanda Gerbrandt. I am in grade 12 at Walter Murray in Saskatoon. Bjarni, we know that one of the programs you have been working on for a long time is aboard the space shuttle with you. Is NIM operating the way you hoped it would? Yeah, I bet you might be able to see it here in the lower part of the view here. It's right beside me to my, uh, to my left here. Uh, and then it's been working very fine. We've uh, turned it on the first day of the flight. It's been operating well in the last four days. Uh, and in fact, right now it's uh, doing some analysis. I don't know whether you can see the little screen beside me here. But it's working very well. We've got uh, good, good isolation. Uh, some of the things we've tried on it haven't worked as well as we'd like, but that's part of the experiment that we're doing with it is to learn how to make it work better. My name is Heather Pond. I am in grade 8 at Evelyn Buckles in Saskatoon. What and how much of Canada can you see from space? I've been pretty lucky that uh, this mission is a high inclination orbit, so we're going up to 57.5 degrees, which just takes us well north of Edmonton and Saskatchewan, or Saskatoon. And uh, I've had a beautiful look at Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton, Montreal, good look at the Maritimes and some of the Great Lakes. It's been uh, fabulous to see Canada from up there. My name is Bronwyn Brooks. I'm in grade 9 at Holy Cross High School. Describe how it felt to be launched into space. Okay, uh, I've seen a number of shuttle launches over the past few years, and they're pretty spectacular when you look at them from the ground, but uh, being inside is a very unique, ex unique experience. You know, you wait there in anticipation on the launch pad as you come to the last few minutes of launch, and then uh, you finally feel the kick of the main engines coming on, and the shuttle sort of pitches forward a bit and then springs back, and then you get this little kick in your back when the solids come on, and that kick just stays there and propels you upwards. It's quite a sensation. It's a lot of vibration. It lasts for a couple of minutes, and then those solids are off, and then you just get a steady, clean push. It just keeps pushing you onwards into space, and it builds up to about three Gs after about six minutes, and by then, your beat is a little bit labored because you've been under this G load for a long time, but it's, it's quite an exciting uh, ride. It went a lot faster than I expected, and, and it was a little smoother than I expected as well. It was a uh, it's an incredible ride up in this space, and it goes so fast. My name is Nicholas Kinner, and I'm grade 9 at Hoy Cross High School in Saskatoon. Bjorn, my question for you is this. Have you or any members of the crew experienced space motion sickness or back pain? And if so, how has this affected what you have been able to accomplish? Well, uh, back pain and motion sickness are... Uh, Pretty common up here. Uh, most of this crew has been pretty good. I was uh, green on the second day of the flight, but I managed to do all of my work, and uh, and after a couple of days, everybody's just fine. Uh, back pain is something that happens because your spine elongates a bit because you're not under the compression force of gravity all the time up here. So you get a little bit longer in space, and that puts some pressures on, pressure on your spine. And uh, so I've had a little bit of back pain, but not very much, not enough to disturb my sleep. And right now, it's basically all gone away. 